Good, well now this afternoon we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit because one of the things I missed out of my talk this morning was the fourth step onto the way of salvation. And my book, The Normal Christian Birth, which is here, the thesis of the book is very simple. To get people properly started on the way, we need to help them in four steps. We need to help them to repent, we need to help them to believe, we need to help them to be baptized, and we need to help them to receive the Holy Spirit. And I remember that simply by using the word rubber and forgetting the vowels, R-B-B-R. Repent, believe, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. That's how I remember it. And I think whenever we counsel an inquirer, we need to have those four steps in mind. Now, I'm not giving you theory. This is what I practice. And I told you this morning about 1,200, 1,500 young people in New Zealand who all wanted to enter the kingdom. And so I told them, you need four things. I will help you to the first, but you need all four. And so I began to help them to repent, which is the one that takes the time. But I said, you'll need to go on to the other three. And I told them about the four steps onto the way of salvation or into the kingdom of God. Um, I have rather copied the crusade for Christ, four spiritual laws, but I call them four spiritual doors that you need to go through. And if you want to give any inquirer a really good start on the way, you need to help them with all these four things. They're the essential foundation. They're the four sparking plugs in the engine. And if you get them going on all four, they will make good progress and make strong Christians. If you want to get them on three of the four, it's like a car firing on three or four cylinders. It'll go, but when you get to a steep hill, it'll stop. If you're only firing on two, you might, you might just keep going with a strong wind behind you. If you're only firing on one, you can guess they won't get, get anywhere. And yet people are counseling inquirers and not telling them about these four basic essentials. They're the four corner foundation stones of a Christian life. I won't say much about repentance. Uh, I could, and we could spend an hour on that, except to say that it must go through three phases. True repentance begins with thought, then it becomes word, and then it becomes deed. The thought is to change your mind and think God's way about your life and realize that it's God's commands you've broken, it's God's love you've spurned, it's, it's God whose anger you've stimulated, that it's uh, God has been most affected by your life. That makes it different from regret, which is what you feel about what you've done to yourself, and from remorse, which is what you feel about what you've done to other people, and repentance is what you feel you've done to God. So it begins in thought, and the word repent means rethink. Pent, pensive, think. But the second part of repentance is word. In your thought, you're convicted of sin, but in your word, it's confession of sin. And I really believe in confessing sins, not necessarily to a priest. Though as I told some of you last weekend, 60 priests were here in confessions for an hour and a half after I'd given one talk. I don't rejoice in confession of priests, but I do rejoice that was more confession of sin than I've had after one address in a long time. Hundreds were confessing their sins. And even though the Roman Catholic practice was to do it to a priest, at least they were doing it. And thank God for that. So conviction of mind, confession of word, and the third step is correction. And that's when it becomes deed of repentance. John the Baptist said to those who wanted to be baptized, bring forth fruit of repentance. And they said, well, what do you mean? Well, he said, if you've got too many clothes, go and give some away to people who've got none. If you're bullying other people, then stop bullying them. And he spelled it all out in very practical terms, what repentance is when you do it. And it's doing repentance that is the key. Uh, paying off your debts, breaking off wrong relationships. Whatever is wrong and can be put right, needs to be put right. There's a text in Acts I've never heard a preacher take. It begins, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. How many of you have heard that text? And you know who said it? Paul. How many of you could tell me, I won't ask you, but I'd like you to put your hand up, if you could tell me the rest of that quotation. Because Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, so I... No? No? He did say that, but that's in 1 Corinthians 15. What did he say in Acts 26? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, so I... I'm afraid I'll have to complete it for you. So I preached repentance to the Gentiles that they should turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And wherever Paul preached, he began with repentance. On the Mars Hill in Athens, God now commands everyone to repent. And that's where the gospel begins, repent. And uh, just to bring it down to earth, there was a man, a young man came to see me one day on a motorbike. It, it had uh, mirrors and handlebars up here, you know the kind of bike with his feet out here. Heard him coming a mile off. And there he was on my doorstep and I said, what is it, Paul? I want to talk. I said, all right, come on in. He had a complete black leather outfit covered with brass metal studs. You know the kind of biker's outfit? And he sat down in, on our armchair and it still bears the marks of the studs. <laughs> and I said, what do you want to talk about, Paul? He said, I want to be baptized. I said, do you know how we baptize people here? He said, yeah, you duck them in the water. I've seen you. And I said, all right, Paul, you want to be ducked in the water. I said, Paul, do you know what the word repent means? Nah. I said, Paul, I want you to go home and I want you to ask Jesus a question. I want you to ask Jesus, is there anything in my life that you don't like? 
when people say they never get answers to prayer, I always tell them to pray that. And it works every time. But I said, go home, ask Jesus, anything in my life you don't like, then cut it out and come back to me. About three weeks later, vroom, vroom, and here he is back. Opened the door and said, well, Paul, what is it? He said, there. I said, what do you mean, there? I've stopped biting my nails. <laughs> there it was. I said, right, I'll baptize you now, Paul. And he never looked back after that. Made a great Christian. Do you know, most of the people baptized in this country, they haven't even been asked to stop biting their nails. I was asking for proof of his repentance. Practical proof that he meant business with the Lord. And he just said, stop biting my nails. That was enough for me. Paul said, I preached repentance to the Gentiles and that they should prove their repentance by their deeds. Please don't baptize people on profession of faith. Baptize them on proof of repentance and you'll really get further with them. Very simple. Prove to me. Show me that you've repented, that you've changed your mind, that you're in business with the Lord. And for me, that was quite enough for Paul. For Paul, that was a big thing. That was really a big thing in his life to stop biting his nails. But there we are. So that's repentance. And I find that you need to take time to help people to repent. It's not just saying, I'm sorry for all my sins. That's not repentance. Repentance is realizing what you've done to God, confessing your sins, plural, and putting right what you can put right. Paying off your debts, breaking off that wrong relationship, and so on. So that's all I'm going to say about repentance. I don't need to say anything about faith, except to say that again, faith is something you do. It's not something you feel. It's not something you think, though it may begin with that. But it's something you do. Now, we had three children. One is now in heaven. But we had three children, and we used to play a game called faith. They loved it. We would go to the stairs in our house, and they would climb up four or five steps and stand in a row, three of them. And I would stand at the bottom with my hands behind my back, and they would say, Daddy, if we jump, will you catch us? And I would say, I might, and I might not. Try me. And then one of them would jump, and I would catch them. And that emboldened the other two to jump, and I would catch them. And I was trying to teach them that faith is jumping and believing he'll catch you. It's taking a leap. It's doing something to show someone that you trust them and will obey them. That's faith. Well, we don't play that game now. Uh, for, health, for health reasons. My health, because they're all taller than I am. And uh, so we don't play it now. But at least they learned what faith was through that game. They loved it. It was their equivalent of watching a TV nasty. You know, gave them really thrill in here. But that's what faith is. It's jumping and believing the Lord will catch you. It's confessing him in public and believing that he'll back you up. It's, it's acting as if you trust him. It's doing something to show you trust him. I was preaching in a very modern church in Germany. And I was trying to teach them about faith. And I said, how many of you believe in me? And about half a dozen people put a tentative hand up. I said, how many of you believe that I exist? And every hand in the church went up. I said, well, let's go back to the real question. How many of you believe in me? Still only half a dozen hands went up. And I said, you professed faith in me, you have them. But I don't know if you do. You would have to prove it to me. And I happened to say to a lady in the front row, quite well-dressed lady, I thought she could take a bit of a joke. And I said, you put your hand up. I don't know if you believe in me. But if you gave me your money to look after, I would then know that you believed in me. And the whole place went silent as the grave and froze. And afterwards, the pastor said to me, did you realize who that lady was? I said, no. He said, she's the richest woman in Hanover. Her husband died and left her all the property in the middle of the city. And she's a multimillionaire. And I said, if you let me look after your money, I'll, <laughs> I'll know that you believe in me. So it rather fell flat, that one. <laughs> in fact, I found that it was her money that had built the modern church we were meeting in. Pardon? Sorry? I could have been. But... Um, I was trying to teach them. I don't know if you pro you've professed faith by putting your hand up, but I don't know if you do, unless you do something to show me that you trust me. Got the picture? And faith in the Bible is, is like that. It's doing something to show the Lord that you trust him. That's real faith. It's not just saying, I profess faith. You can profess faith easily enough. It's possessing faith that is the saving thing. So I'll say no more about faith, and I'll say no more about baptism because I've said a lot this morning. But I want to talk this afternoon about the fourth essential basic step, and that is to receive the Holy Spirit. And straight away you will realize that I don't think believing in Jesus and receiving the Spirit are the same thing. It's very obvious in the New Testament that there were some who believed who didn't receive the Holy Spirit. And something had to be done to catch them up with that omission. But the general evangelical teaching has been that when you receive Jesus, which is not a scriptural thing to say, you also receive the Holy Spirit at the same time, unconsciously. That the two are one and the same thing. The New Testament never talks about receiving Jesus after he ascended to heaven. It talks about receiving Jesus while he was on earth. It's meant inviting him into your home. Zacchaeus received Jesus. But from his return to heaven, the verb receive is transferred exclusively to the third person of the Holy Trinity who has taken the place of Jesus on earth. Our Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father and has sent his Holy Spirit to be another comforter to us, to be to us what he had been when he was on earth, to the twelve. And so from Pentecost onwards, no evangelist, no apostle said receive Jesus. 
Yet that's what most evangelists today say. Receive him into your life. Receive him into your heart. I've heard all this so often I want to scream. Go back to the New Testament. Believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. That's the New Testament evangelism. There is only one verse that somebody could bring up and I think one of you will, so I better deal with it now. There's a verse in Philippians, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. I can only tell you that the verb receive there is quite different from the normal receive, which in Greek is lambano. But the Greek word there is paralambano, and it literally means to beside receive, and it means to be taught about something or someone. And it's saying, as you paralambined Christ, as you received, as you were taught about him, so walk in him. But it doesn't say, as you receive Christ. It uses a different word. The word receive after Pentecost is always used of the Holy Spirit. Never did they talk about receiving Jesus. As soon as you talk about receiving Jesus, you've put together two different phrases in the New Testament into one, which does talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. And when you transfer it back to the second person, you are virtually saying you receive the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. And that's where the confusion comes in and where evangelists can counsel people without ever mentioning the Holy Spirit. And I was a Christian who for years didn't know the Holy Spirit. No one introduced me to him. And I'll probably give you my testimony this afternoon of how I received the Holy Spirit after I was a minister, pastor, after I was preaching. Now, looking back, I know that my condition was exactly what the apostles' condition was before Pentecost. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit has been with you, but he will be in you. And the difference between those two relationships is astonishing. The Holy Spirit had been with me, though I didn't know it, and I didn't acknowledge it. But from the day that I received the Spirit, the Spirit was in me. And that's a huge step. So the apostles had to take that step. They'd been out, they'd preached, they'd healed, they'd cast out demons. They'd done it in the name of Jesus. But when Jesus said, the Holy Spirit has been with you, that's what he was talking about. But even so, that wasn't enough. So he told them, wait in Jerusalem until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, really get hold of this, being baptized in the Spirit and receiving the Spirit are one and the same thing. <coughs> Check me out in everything I say on this because they're very important. Whereas Pentecostal theology has made them two different things. In the New Testament, they are one and the same. You don't receive the Spirit twice in the New Testament. You receive it once, and that's when you're baptized in it, once. We're going to look at all these terms very carefully because there is such confusion over the third person of the Holy Trinity. It's dividing congregations, it's dividing churches, it's causing endless problems because we didn't start with the New Testament. Or we started with the traditional evangelical position, or we started with the Pentecostal position, or another position, instead of going back to the Bible and seeing what the Bible said. And I say it again, and this is a root of my theology, my pneumatology, or theology of the Spirit. And it is that receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit is exactly the same thing, the same experience. And any reference in the New Testament to either term, baptized in or receiving, is referring to exactly the same thing. Check me out in your Bible in all that I'm telling you. And so I say to people, you need to believe in Jesus and you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about two different things. It is assumed everywhere in evangelical circles in Britain that if you've received Jesus, you've received the Holy Spirit. It doesn't follow at all. It is quite clear. Take just one example in the New Testament in Acts 19. Paul says, did you receive Holy Spirit when you believed? And he assumes they understand his question and that they can answer it with yes or no because they would know if they had received the Spirit. They knew they had believed. Or he thought they knew that. They confessed later they didn't even know that. Nevertheless, he is assuming that they were believers who hadn't received the Spirit. And he must have noticed something missing from their life that said they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. They were talking, he thought as believers, but for Paul it was perfectly possible to believe and not receive. And he never talked about receiving Jesus, because that just confused the issue. He talked about believing in Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit. Acts 8 is another clear example. The Samaritans responded to Philip's preaching. There was great joy in the city. They repented. They believed the good news, but they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. And word of that got back to Jerusalem, and they sent Peter and sent them straight down to put the thing right. And yet, you and I, they, they were seeing miracles in Samaria. Now, if you had evangelized in the city of Cincinnati, and you saw crowds of people repenting of their sins and believing, and filled with joy and witnessing miracles, you would walk away and say, oh, what a successful campaign. But it wasn't successful in the eyes of the apostles. And they came down straight away to Samaria to put the situation right. Now, the questions that come to your mind from that one incident are questions like this. How did anybody know they hadn't received the Holy Spirit? And the other important question, how did anybody know when they had? Just ask those two simple questions. Everybody knew that in spite of their joy, their faith, their repentance, that they hadn't received the Spirit. How? There must have been some very clear indication that they hadn't. And then Peter and James came down and prayed for them, and they received the Holy Spirit one by one as they were prayed for. And now everybody knew that they had received. And Simon the magician, with whom I have no sympathy when I make tricks for you, um, just throwing that in in case you thought, um, 
Simon says, oh, I, I can do with this power. Please, can I buy the secret? Laying hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit. Boy, that's some, some trick. And you know what Peter said to him? To hell with you and your money. Check me out. He said, your money perish with you. <laughs> In modern language, to hell with you and your money. You haven't even repented. Now, why did Simon, why was he so sure that people had received the Holy Spirit? We need to ask these questions because they point to answers. And we want the answers to all this. So I have made a, a, quite a deep study of this whole question, and I've published my fruits of my thinking in a book called Jesus Baptizes in One Holy Spirit. I don't know if we've got that book available for you, but you have it. There it is. Jesus Baptizes in One Holy Spirit. And I, I want to give you the gist of that book, and that other sheet is giving you the chapter titles in the book. I'm going to do that once or twice now. It's not to get you to buy the book, but it's to give you a taste of what I'm saying in the book, and it will give you the, the gist of it. Let's begin with chapter one, the surprising silence. What I mean by that is this. John the Baptist, who prepared for Jesus' coming and prepared the way as a forerunner, said two things about Jesus. One, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Two, he is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now, the interesting thing is John said that first thing about the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world only to two people. But the second thing he said, that Jesus would baptize the Holy Spirit, he said to everybody who came to him. And the funny thing is that the church has picked up the first thing that they only, he only said to two, and has universally ignored the second thing that he said to everybody. What a surprising silence. Now, you can write this down and you can blame me for saying it, but Jesus was a Baptist. <laughs> and I hope you realize that. There were two people given the same title in your New Testament, John and his cousin Jesus. So I'm very happy to tell you that Jesus was a Baptist. The Greek word is ho baptizai, and it meant he who baptizes. And that's applied to John, and we call him John the Baptist. Why then do we never call Jesus the Baptist? Same word is applied to Jesus, and it's John who applied it to Jesus. He said, I'm the one who baptizes you in water, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And the phrase he uses is exactly the same that we translate the Baptist of John. So why don't we talk about Jesus as the Baptist? Maybe because of the denominational label there is now. But Jesus was a Baptist. He was the one who baptized people, not in water, but in the Holy Spirit. Now that statement about Jesus as the baptizer, baptizer in the Holy Spirit occurs in every one of the four Gospels at the very beginning. Why then do we never hear churches talk about this? It's a surprising silence. It's as if churches are embarrassed to talk about Jesus baptizing us in his Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus' ancient followers were happy to talk that way, but his modern followers seem embarrassed. <coughs> Five times in the New Testament, Jesus is called the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And you probably know the fifth one in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. You are all baptized in one spirit and all made to drink of the same spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That's the fifth time. And the phrase there is exactly the same as John the Baptist used. Baptized in Holy Spirit. The definite article is missing out of every reference because the Holy Spirit is the medium in which we are baptized by the Lord Jesus. So as he, John baptized en nudity in water, Jesus baptizes en nudity in spirit. And all I've done in the title of my book is put the Gospels together with the 1 Corinthians and said Jesus baptizes in one Holy Spirit. And the title is meant to bring the five references together. Well, now that's chapter one. Chapter two is a survey of the Old Testament. And first of all, in the kingdom of Israel, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit anointed people, came on people, and came off them as well. And only on a minority of people in the Old Testament, but it enabled them to do the impossible, to be the unattainable, and to say the inconceivable. The effect of the Holy Spirit's anointing in the Old Testament was to enable them to do what they couldn't do, to be what they couldn't be, and to say what they couldn't say. Especially that third point, prophecy. Again and again, the prophets say, the Holy Spirit came on me, and I said this. And so the Holy Spirit was given in the Old Testament to a few people in the people of God to do, be, and say the impossible. And the New Testament takes all those three things up. The difference when you turn to the New Testament and the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit is this, that a, f a promise made in Joel is now fulfilled, that regardless of age, sex, or class, the Holy Spirit is poured out on everybody. That's the only difference. And now everybody can do and be and say what otherwise they could never do, be, and say. It's exciting, isn't it? It's the supernatural for ordinary people. And regardless of your age, young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. Regardless of your sex, men and women will both be filled. And regardless of your class, your maid servants even will find themselves filled with the Spirit. What a promise. And we are living in the age of the Holy Spirit, when anybody can be filled with the Holy Spirit, when everybody can do things that otherwise they could never have done. And one of the things that has thrilled me in a normal church life is that some of the most ordinary people who would be dismissed as ungifted people can exercise supernatural gifts. And it's a joy when they do. And some of our greatest experiences in church life together came about because a very ordinary person exercised an extraordinary gift.
And that opens up a whole possibility of ministry in the church. Anybody can be a minister now. We're all priests. And this opens up every member ministry. The early Pentecostals knew it. When they came to Norway, somebody asked, how many members do you now have in your churches in Norway? And he said, 500. And they said, and how many ministers do you have? He said, same number. That's the New Testament church, when everybody has a gift for the body as a whole. And there aren't just a few gifted people at the top doing everything. That's not the New Testament. I'm going to, by the way, tomorrow, I'm going to give you in the morning some of the very practical lessons we learned seeking to be a New Testament church in the 20th century. And I just want to share some of the lessons we learned. Sometimes we learn them the hard way, but uh, we learn them uh, of how to be a New Testament church today. And we'll share that tomorrow morning. In the afternoon, I'm going to share on that vital subject, divorce and remarriage, because that, in the Lord's mind, is his number one complaint about the church today, that only people who are hearing from him. And there are prophetic Christians in this country. They have written to me and told me what they're hearing from the Lord on that subject, which is perhaps the biggest blockage to the free flow of the Holy Spirit in America. It's now becoming so important. That's tomorrow afternoon. So if you don't want to know about those things, don't come tomorrow. But that's tomorrow's program, morning afternoon. And uh, that's what we hope to do, God willing. Right, that's chapter two. And in the kingdom of God, we have a spirit anointed sovereign, a king who was uniquely filled with the Holy Spirit without measure, we're told in John's gospel. Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without measure. And so he had all the gifts. And all the charismatic gifts were in Jesus. But in us, they're spread around among us. But the whole body of Christ can have all the gifts. And incidentally, I'll say this tomorrow, but that's where your group of Christians in fellowship can be too small to be a church. If it's only a few Christians meeting in a house, it's statistically unlikely that all the gifts will be present in 10 people meeting in a home. And I find that all over the world, Christians are getting out of churches and say, oh, but we meet with a few Christians in our home. There can't be a church. A church, which is the body of Christ, will have all the gifts to share. So you need to be a certain size up to enjoy church life of all the gifts. I'm also going to tell you tomorrow morning, you can get too big to be a church. And then the gifts of the Spirit are suppressed. But we'll come back to that tomorrow. So we have a Spirit-anointed sovereign and Spirit-saturated subjects in the kingdom of God. That's why if not all your members in your church are baptized in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit or whatever, you're not fully a New Testament church because they won't have discovered their gift until they have received the Holy Spirit. When we look at chapter 3, the final fulfillment, you must know that the Gospels are describing the condition of the disciples before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They certainly had a degree of the Spirit. They cast out demons, they cleansed lepers, they raised the dead. But the Spirit was only with them. He wasn't in them yet. And that was going to make a huge difference. So when you study the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you're looking at a situation before, <laughs> before the Spirit was received. When you look at the epistles of the New Testament, they're all written after the Spirit was received. And every epistle of the New Testament assumes that its readers have received. So there's not much about receiving the Spirit in the letters. That's after and working it all out. So the one part of the New Testament we need to go to to find out what happens during the reception of the Spirit is the book of Acts. And that's from which we get our doctrine of receiving the Holy Spirit. And therefore in Acts we've got a description of Pentecost when they received and a description of post-Pentecost events. Again, you can get the book if you want to know more about that. Chapter 4 is a crucial chapter because there I have listed all that the New Testament says about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I've put it under four headings, four questions, who, how, when, why, and given two answers to each of those questions. And therefore, I have covered the entire New Testament doctrine of receiving the Spirit in this chapter. When we say who is involved in the reception of the Spirit, the baptizer is involved, and that's Jesus. And believers are involved. The Spirit is not given to unbelievers. John's Gospel makes that quite clear. They are strangers to the Spirit. The world does not know the Holy Spirit. Uh, only believers receive the Holy Spirit. That's the first limitation that there is. So that's who is involved. Always Jesus is involved. It's Jesus who baptizes someone in the Holy Spirit. Nobody else can. I wish I could. I can baptize people in water if they ask me. I can't baptize them in the Holy Spirit. I can pray for them. I think of one vicar, a Church of England vicar, who came to me once and said, David, will you please pray for me to receive the Holy Spirit? And I said, yes. But before I do, I must ask you a question. Are you willing to be led by the Spirit? And he said, what do you mean? I said, if I pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit, will you from that moment do everything the Spirit told you? And he said, I think so. I said, well, supposing the Spirit tells you, a vicar of the Church of England, to get baptized as a believer, will you do it? And he said, will the Spirit tell me to do that? I said, I don't know. But I found him say that to so many people that I think he might. Now, of course, here he is, a baby christening vicar. Uh, and he knows that uh, if he gets baptized as a believer, he could be thrown out of the church. It's the only unforgivable sin in the Church of England. You can be a Church of England vicar and be a Freemason, or a homosexual, or even an agnostic. But if you get baptized as a believer, out. It's the one unforgivable sin in the established Church of England in my country because it's considered 
a slap in the face of those who baptized babies for so long. And I'd be a wealthy man if I had a five pound note for every vicar who's been secretly baptized as a believer. But they all keep it secret from their bishop. And I refuse to baptize as a believer an Anglican who won't tell people. But they all do. And they all tell me, oh, I've been baptized as a believer, but I haven't told anybody. I think that's awful. But anyway, um, my second question about receiving the Spirit is how? And my double answer is this. In every case in the New Testament, it was a conscious experience. People knew when they received. If a Christian says to me, I don't know if I've received the Holy Spirit or not, then I'd say you haven't. <laughs> you would know. It is an experience, a conscious experience. And everybody in the New Testament knew whether they had or had not. It was, a, one scholar put it like this, a man called William Barclay, he said, receiving the Spirit in the New Testament was as definite as catching influenza. And I like that. You know when you've got the flu. <laughs> and you know when you've got the Spirit. It is an experience. It is a conscious experience. So that you know when you received Him. And the second part of the how question is, and there is evidence for anyone present at the time to know. It is such a definite experience that it is also evidence. Every time in the New Testament, when people receive, the others knew. It is not only an experience, it is an experience with evidence. I was sitting in a public park in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. It's a new city, been built from scratch in the middle of the jungle. And I was sitting with a dear missionary with Wycliffe Bible translators. I don't know if you've heard of them. And uh, he'd been faithfully serving the Lord, translating the Bible into uh, a jungle Indian language in the Amazon jungle. And he was a lo lovely guy, he was English, a little shy and a little, little reserved. After all, we English are terribly reserved. And um, he said, you know, David, I've served the Lord faithfully for years in the jungle here. I've done the best I possibly can to translate his word. But he said, I don't know if I've received the Holy Spirit. And he said, I've never done anything supernatural. I've never performed a miracle. And he said, I, I just don't know. And I said, I'm going to pray for you that you may receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, fine, I'd like that. So we were sitting on the grass in this public park, and I just put a hand on him, and I said, Lord, this dear brother served you so faithfully, and I'm sure you know that, Lord, but he wants more. And I pray that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit on him. And he opened his mouth, and he said, Hallelujah! <laughs> and everybody in the park looked around. And I sort of pulled away from him a bit. <laughs> I, I don't want to be associated with that guy. And he said, is that it? <laughs> I said, that's good enough for me. When a reserved Englishman yells at the top of his voice, Hallelujah! Boy, something could hold of that man. I said, yes, you have now received. And within 24 hours, he healed three sick people, three very sick people. And now he could do things that he could never have done. He was well-educated, he could translate the Bible all right, but now he was healing the sick. I just mentioned that because the evidence is usually something that comes out of the mouth. Did you know that God gave you an overflow? Um, I told you I, I like having a bath at home, and there's a hole underneath the taps. It's called an overflow, and when I fill the bath right up, it goes out and it makes a funny noise. Blah, 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 and uh, a little lady downstairs can hear that. And she shouts up, you've taken all the hot water again. <laughs> she heard the overflow. Now, God gave you an overflow. If you don't know where it is, put your finger on your nose and then just go down. And you'll hit a hole. And that's your overflow. And Jesus said, whatever your heart is full of will come out of your mouth. And if your heart is full of dirt, it'll come out of your mouth. If your heart is full of fear, you'll scream. If your heart is full of fun, you'll laugh. Whatever you're full of inside has a way of coming out of your mouth. If you're full of fear, you... I've said that, you scream. But whatever, if you're full of anger, you shout at somebody. Whatever your heart is full of, Jesus said, will come out of your mouth. And that is the normal overflow. How do you know when your petrol tank of your car and your gasoline tank, sorry, is full? It overflows. There's a hole there and it comes out. And whatever you are full of comes out of your mouth. And I found that an invariable rule, that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it'll come out of your mouth. I am not among those who say it's got to be tongues. Because in the New Testament, it's a different thing. Sometimes it's just an overflow of praise. Sometimes it's prophecy. But every time in the New Testament, I knew of that they received the Spirit, something came out of their mouth. It simply was full to overflowing. And that's what I look for. And when that man yelled hallelujah, something was coming out of his mouth that had never come out before from a reserved Englishman in public, with the public all around him. No, no, that was real enough. And the proof was that he was healing within 24 hours. So he was doing much more than translating the word of God from then on. So it's an experience with evidence, and the evidence comes out of the mouth in some form or another. And that's what I personally look for and know when a person has received. Now, when we ask the question when, some people think you'll be filled with the Spirit after years of faithful service. It's a kind of reward at the end of the road. But a Welshman, no less, said to me once, David, in his Welsh accent, he said, have you ever noticed that they received the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and not Acts 28? And I said, what's new? <laughs> and he said, they received the Spirit at the beginning, not at the end. They needed to start with the Holy Spirit. And so he said, the Holy Spirit is the reward for years of faithfulness. It's equipment at the beginning to get you going. And I said, well, I've learned something now. That went into my thinking that it's part of Christian initiation. And the sooner people are introduced to the Holy Spirit, the better. But the average counseling technique never mentions the Holy Spirit. It doesn't teach people how to receive the Holy Spirit or what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Everybody who's been baptized in water knows they have. They can remember it. 
And Paul expected people to remember when they'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me give you my own personal testimony. I knew Jesus and I knew his Father. And on the strength of that, I began preaching. I even went into the ministry and I was preaching what I knew to be the gospel faithfully. And the Lord blessed that. I have to admit that the Holy Spirit was with me because people were converted and the church filled up. But I didn't know the Holy Spirit, not personally. And so I dreaded one Sunday every year, Pentecost Sunday, when I was expected to preach on the Holy Spirit. And I dreaded that Sunday coming up. And before it came up, I used to get all the books I could on the Holy Spirit, put together a sermon from other people's thoughts. You know how you do, or don't you? <laughs> uh, but I managed to produce a couple of sermons on the Holy Spirit once a year and was so thankful to get back to the gospel the next Sunday. I'm being very honest with you, that was my position. I dreaded that Sunday because I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. I believed in him up here. I believed the creeds and I believed that God was a trinity. I didn't know him. I even in my final postgraduate year in Cambridge University did a thesis um, on what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I wrote a whole paper for my examiners. And my conclusion was nobody knows. And I managed to put a lot of Greek and Hebrew into it and all the things the scholars like when you do a paper for them. But I said, it's too long ago and too far away for anybody to be sure what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I got a degree for that. That's called emptying the church by degrees. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> anyway, be that as it may. But that was my position. And because I preached the gospel so faithfully on the other Sunday, well, I was acclaimed as an evangelical preacher and invited to preach in other churches and conferences and still not knowing the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought this can't go on, it's dishonest. So I announced that I was going to preach 20 sermons in a row on the Holy Spirit. And I was really forcing myself to do something about that. And so I began at Genesis and I preached on every reference to the Holy Spirit. I got right through the Old Testament without difficulty. Managed to talk about Samson, all the others, how the Spirit was with them, because it was all sort of third hand, you know? And then I got into the New Testament and I began to wish I'd never started. I thought, I've got to deal with Acts. And I'd arranged to deal with Acts 2 on Pentecost Sunday. I thought that would be nice and appropriate. I thought, why did I start this wretched series? And I got into John 15, 14 and 15, about the other couple there. I was still fairly comfortable, but I was dreading going on. And I thought, is there any way to stop this? And I couldn't do any way to stop it without losing face. And that's a real problem. Now, I ought to explain that at this time, there was a man in the church called James, who was the self-appointed leader of the opposition. Uh, do you know what I mean? The Lord seems to have selected one person in each church to be the self-appointed leader of the opposition. And every church meeting we had, I came home so depressed to my wife, and I said, there's James again, undoing everything I'm trying to do. He had two reasons for opposing me. One, we've never done that before. Two, we've done it before and it didn't work. And between these two, he was a brilliant man. He was in charge of the patent office in London, and he had a brain on him. And he was undoing almost everything I suggested. And my wife said, look, David, it's only James. The rest are all with you. Don't get so hung up about James. He's only one member. But he was a clever member, and he was an outspoken member. And he was my thorn in the flesh. Once a year, that man got hay fever. You call it that here? Uh, in, um, liquid in the chest. And he'd had this from a baby. And once a year, about May or June, he got this. And he literally was put to bed for up to six weeks and could hardly breathe. And uh, it happened. And I was always glad when it happened. <laughs> because we could hold meetings without James. And everything went swimmingly. So I was very grateful to the Lord for his illness. And um, so he went down and was confined to bed. And I thought, I must go and visit him my duty as a pastor so I went off and all the way to his house my brain kept saying James 5 James 5 James 5 and I thought well James is his name but what's this 5 and of course it was the fifth chapter of the letter of James where it says is anyone sick let him call for the elders let him anoint him and so on and he will recover and I thought oh no Lord, <laughs> not James 5 please and I got to him and he lay on the bed gasping for breath grey face he looked dreadful and he said what do you think about James 5 I said well uh, why do you ask <laughs> well he, uh, he said I've got to go to Switzerland on Thursday morning morning on business and he said and the doctors put me to bed for at least two weeks and he said would you come and anoint me with oil and I'd never done that and so I used the usual pastors let out and I said I'll pray about it <laughs> meaning I'll jolly well not pray about it but anyway I tried to pray about it have you ever tried to pray for a sick person that you're glad is sick <laughs> it's it's really quite difficult to know what to pray and uh, anyway Wednesday evening came and still I'd done nothing and his wife rang me up and said James wants to know are you coming to anoint him I said, oh, all right, I'll come tonight. I'll bring some of the other leaders. And I went to a chemist shop, a pharmaceutical shop, and bought a bottle of olive oil, quite a big one. Never needed it before, so I had this bottle. And then before I went that night, I thought, this is no good luck. And I went into the church by myself, and I knelt in my own pulpit. I said, Lord, I don't want James to get better. And I tried to pray, and I couldn't pray. And then suddenly, I was praying for that man with all my heart. And it was pouring out of me. Prayer for James. Only it wasn't in English. I don't know what the language was. It sounded like Chinese to me. And I remember looking at my watch and I've not been praying for an hour. 
for one moment to pray for Nala. Never. And then I thought, I wonder if I can do that again. <laughs> I bowed my hand over my mouth, and now I'm speaking perfect Russian. I thought, Lord, this is me. I thought, Lord, this is Acts 2. This is what happened. And I was so excited because I thought, when we go tonight to Jimmy, we're going to see miracles. So that night, I went with a big bottle of oil and the other leaders, and we went into Jimmy's bedroom, and there he lay gasping. And I used James 5, like you use an automobile manual to service it. You know what I mean? You, you go through the manual and you say, well, now we should do this. So I read it and said, oh, James, it says we should confess our sins to one another. So I said, James, I've never liked you. <laughs> and, and, it, and he said, that's mutual. <laughs> and I said, now what do we do next? I said, we, we, we confessed our sins, so it says anoint with oil. So I took the uh, bottle top off, I poured the oil over his head, all over his head. <laughs> it was on the pillow everywhere. I didn't think oil could spread that far. And then guess what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I said, well, we've done everything, Jimmy. Don't think there's anything else to do? He said, no. And I got up and I ran away. And I got, got as far as the door. And something stopped me and I turned back. I said, have you still got your ticket, air ticket for tomorrow for Switzerland? Oh, yes, he said, of course. I said, I'll pick you up and run you to Heathrow Airport, okay? And I ran. And I didn't sleep that night. And the next morning, I didn't dare get in touch with him. I was scared. I said, Lord, you got me into this mess. <laughs> what would be like now? He'll be my worst enemy now. Anyway, the phone rang. And the boy said, hello, this is James. Can you pick me up at 10.30? I said, James, you all right? And he said, yes. I said, what happened? He said, in the middle of the night, it was as if two hands squeezed my chest and I brought up a bucket full of liquid. I can breathe. And I said, have you been to the doctor? He said, yes. And he says, I can go. And he said, I've been to have my hair cut. And he said, the barber said to me, you call the barber here? It's barber's quartet, I think. And the barber said to him, I'm afraid I'll have to shampoo your hair before I cut it. He said, I have never known such a great head. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd had a shampoo and his hair cut, and I drove him to London Airport. <laughs> now let me tell you the miracle. He and his wife both got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he became my best friend. Oh, and the one I used to go to whenever I had a problem. James, can you help me? And when the time came for me to leave that church and move on, it was James I told first. And he became my best buddy. And the other thing is, he never had that problem again. <laughs> he was free for the rest of his life. Well, I now know what happened in Acts 2. And I can now preach on Pentecost Sunday. Because I know I received the Holy Spirit that day. And it began dimensions in my ministry that I had no known. And I'm still amazed. Well, that's my testimony. I knew I'd received the Holy Spirit. And other people knew. Because the next Sunday, I preached again from John 16 in the same series. Which I prepared as a whole series together. So I had the material already. And I thought I'd preach the same way as I ever. But a young man came to me after the service, and he said, what happened to you this week? I said, what do you mean, what happened to me this week? Well, he said, this Sunday, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and he noticed that I knew the Holy Spirit now. And that young man is now uh, a preacher himself, and is doing a grand job with Iranians. The Lord has laid Iran on his heart, and he's doing a great job of work, work among Iranian believers. He all started when he said, you know what you're talking about. Well, that's my testimony. I can only tell you what happened. But I believe it is the privilege of every believer to receive the Holy Spirit. And yes, I'm afraid some Christians who've got everything but the Holy Spirit will be resentful and will accuse you of calling them second-class citizens. Have you heard that said? They're actually envious because you've got a dimension to heaven. And you're not going around saying you're second-class Christian because you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't do that. Not in the Holy Spirit to be that. And you don't have a critical attitude to those who haven't got everything you have. Far from it, you're just humbled by it. And think, my, why should God do that to me? Nevertheless, it is still true that it's the privilege of every believer who has believed in Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit, or to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. These are all terms describing the same thing in the New Testament. The only difference is the word filled is used again. In other words, your baptism in the Holy Spirit is your first filling with the Holy Spirit, and you will be filled again, and again, and again. You won't be baptized in the Spirit again. That only happens once. That's your introductory filling. But you can be filled again. And that's why Paul in Ephesians 5.18 says, go on being filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk to get excited. Be filled with the Spirit. That's the Christian's way of getting intoxicated and of getting high, get filled with the Spirit. And so I have preached initiation ever since, that initiation is four steps, repenting, believing, being baptized in water, and be receiving the Spirit or being baptized in the Spirit or whatever term you want to use. Those four give people a good start. And you will know that they will, having started with those four, they'll carry on. They're in the best way now to be independent of you, independent on the Lord, and grow. And one of the great joys of my life is constantly meeting men in the Royal Air Force, whom I just knew for months in the 1950s. And the last one happened just before I came here. A phone call from a man I've never heard of since about 1960. And he said, I, I've just heard you unexpectedly on the television set. I wanted you to know I'm still going on with the Lord. 
and he, he was now the key man in the church in the north of England. Isn't it exciting when you know that your converts are stuck and they're growing and they're going on with the Lord and all the Lord enabled you to do is to get them started and give them a good start. Now, why do we need to receive the Spirit? There are two reasons given in the New Testament. You need the Holy Spirit for your own salvation and for your service to others. Now, I'm not a Pentecostal because I don't believe in Pentecostal theology. They have split those two things and say you receive the Holy Spirit twice. Once for salvation at your conversion and once later for service. The New Testament doesn't make that distinction. You need the Holy Spirit for your own holiness and for your service to others. It's both. And if you split that up into two receptions, and that is the official Pentecostal doctrine, I just don't believe that's the scriptural doctrine. But you must check all this out with your own New Testament. Now, look at the ch chart that I gave you. I've tried here, first of all, to take down the left-hand side those eight marks of receiving the Holy Spirit in the New Testament under those four headings, who, how, when, and why. And I've asked, over the last hundred years or so, what has happened to those eight things? Now, when we look at those who teach sacramental grace, the Roman Catholics teach that when you were baptized as a baby, you received the Holy Spirit. In fact, they don't talk about Jesus as a baptizer. They don't talk about being believers. They don't talk about an experience of receiving the Spirit. And they don't talk about any evidence for others. What they talk about is initiation and incorporation into the body and salvation. But they don't talk about service because they don't understand the gifts of the Spirit. So they are locked into that lower thing. And traditional evangelicals are much the same, funnily enough. They don't emphasize those first four things. They emphasize initiation. At your conversion, you receive the Spirit, whether you know it or not. They emphasize incorporation into the body of Christ. They emphasize salvation. They don't emphasize the gifts of the Spirit. Then there was a big change with some of the Puritans. They didn't talk about Jesus as a baptizer, but they did talk about believers receiving the Holy Spirit. They did say it was an experience, but they didn't discuss any evidence for others. And they did talk about salvation, but not about service. They were not so keen on the gifts. From the Puritans came the holiness movement in America. And the holiness movement got a little further. They didn't really understand Jesus as a baptizer, but they did understand the other things. But they were not so good at seeing receiving the Spirit as initiation into Christ, or as incorporation into the body. Then came the Pentecostals at the beginning of the 20th century, the first wave it was called. And they got the first four things right, but they didn't get much about the bottom. And they saw primarily baptism in the Spirit as making way for gifts of service and they didn't link it up with the other things. And then came the Neo-Pentecostals within main, mainline denominations, the second wave, and you can see what they emphasized. Again, while the Pentecostals did emphasize Jesus as a baptizer, and especially in Los Angeles, people like Amy McPherson and others, they emphasized some things and Jesus as a baptizer, but that disappeared in the Neo-Pentecostal. And what happened was a man called John Wimber came to Britain, and he'd been around here, all right, and he had an agenda which was that if you dropped talk of the baptism in the spirit and only talked about the charismatic gifts, the evangelicals would respond positively and accept the gifts without the baptism. And that was his hidden agenda, which has later been made absolutely clear that he didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that spread widely in Britain. And we got people uh, trying to exercise gifts quite widely. But without the baptism in the spirit, the gifts very quickly faded away. Um, and then you got the charismatic renewal, the third wave. And they did recover some things, but they missed out on others. And finally came the fourth wave uh, associated with uh, Toronto, Pensacola, and so on. And you can see what they made of what I've been teaching you. And quite frankly, the steam has gone out of the charismatic renewal when they stopped talking about Jesus baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. And it was John Wimber who really encouraged us to do that. I I'm just mentioning this so that you understand where it's all heading. I long to see churches get back to that left-hand column and accept the, the total teaching of the New Testament on being baptized in the Spirit because then I think you'll see a proper flow of the Holy Spirit in gifts. Well, that's a chart that um, you could criticize, but I think you might find it helpful. And you notice a kind of pattern, how from the bottom half, there was a switch to the top half, and then a kind of decline again into the bottom half. Oh, when will churches accept all of the New Testament teaching and get it right? That's my longing to see. And that's why I wrote the book, Word and Spirit Together, because I long to see the Word and the Spirit together in churches. Where Back in Britain, we're tending to decline now into word-only and spirit-only churches. There's a kind of reaction to some of the more bizarre Pentecostalism that really can get quite crazy. And um, there's a reaction now. People are going back into word-only churches where they hear the word expounded faithfully, and there's not much happening, and back into spirit-only and forget the word, and they just go crazy. And some of the craziest fellowships in Britain are now just, let the spirit free, just do what you like. And you know, I had a horrible vision. When I was writing the book, Word and Spirit Together, I had originally called it Fourth Wave because I believe that was the right fourth wave to bring it all together. But when Toronto claimed the phrase fourth wave, I had to change the title of the book to Word and Spirit Together. And I just longed to see them brought together. You see, the Spirit, the Word without the Spirit, you'll dry up. The Spirit without the Word, you'll blow up. 
the word with the Spirit, you'll grow up. <laughs> and that's what I long to see, to get back to a full doctrine of the Holy Spirit on which we can all agree, because we all acknowledge that Scripture is the touchstone for all our belief and behavior. And if we allow the New Testament doctrine to bring us back into a biblical experience of the Holy Spirit, without the bizarre things. But the, the vision I had while I was writing the book, to my horror, I can remember now, I was sitting at my desk, and I started sweating. And I thought, Lord, never. That can't happen. But in the vision, I saw a congregation, Spirit-only people, and the visiting speaker, who was an American and I knew who it was, was encouraging them just to let go and do whatever they felt like doing and let the Spirit have free play. And to my horror, they were undressing and taking their clothes off. And the preacher was encouraging it and saying, we are going back to the innocence of the Garden of Eden where they were naked and unashamed. And that's what he wants. And Christ hung naked on the cross for you. Can you be naked for him? And he was using scripture after scripture, encouraged them to throw the clothes away until they